Okay, hello, so everyone. So we have Jaden for... Go ahead, Sorry, Jaden. <laughs> oh, okay. No worries. Uh, here, let me reset. I have a timer. I'm going to start over. No worries. Okay, my name is Jaden Stark. I'm from the University of Alabama Huntsville, and I'm here to uh, blaze through some slides very quickly here. So I want to introduce you to our project named Saros. It's a shadow bands atmospheric research and observation platform. It's a student run project from the Space Hardware Club at the University of Alabama in Huntsville. So I'm gonna go over some of our science objectives, uh, our hardware and our launch history. So a little bit about uh, the Space Hardware Club because you might not have heard of it. Uh, it's an entirely student run organization at the University of Alabama Huntsville with five different programs. I'm just one program manager managing the balloon operations, but it includes rovers and uh, suborbital spacecraft and high powered rocketry uh, with 300 plus members and uh, 15 active projects. So. It's a big organization on our campus. So shadow bands, uh, many of you might be familiar with shadow bands. Uh, this is a oscillatory visible light phenomenon that's associated with total solar eclipses. So it's these moving bands of light and shadow that cross the surface of Earth just prior to and just following uh, eclipse totality. And so the main uh, model for this is the atmospheric scintillation model, uh, which proposes that turbulent layers in Earth's atmosphere are actually refracting this focused corona of the eclipse. You can see it's kind of smearing that corona shape that we see leading up to absolute totality, and it's smearing it across the surface of Earth. And primarily, this is due to uh, smearing in the bottom two kilometers of Earth's atmosphere. So there's not really been too many experiments we've seen that's done in situ measurements of shadow band size, frequency, and direction uh, throughout Earth's atmosphere. And of course, high altitude balloons are a great platform to achieve that. So that's one of the main goals of this project is to model shadow bands or take in situ measurements to help model shadow bands as a function of altitude. Uh, one interesting thing is also that studies from the 2017 eclipse have shown a high altitude shadow band formation at altitudes above 20 kilometers. So previous experiments have found uh, matching frequencies of light oscillations from ground-based measurements, but also high altitude measurements, which are outside of 90% of Earth's atmospheric density. So if shadow bands are only formed through the Earth's atmosphere, it's kind of interesting there would be shadow band formation uh, at the upper altitudes above 20 kilometers. So that's something we also wanted to investigate as part of our experiment. And you can see here, there's a uh, five hertz band of uh, frequency here. It's hard, kind of hard to read, but between two ground units, two flight units, uh, you see uh, formation of light oscillations at the same time, uh, separated, of course, by 20 kilometers of altitude. So kind of interesting data coming from the 2017 eclipse. So what we designed uh, is this instrument. It has four light sensors on a flat plate that are a fixed distance apart. And effectively, as the oscillatory light moves across it, you're going to see peaks and valleys uh, in the analog signal from those. And since they're a fixed distance apart, we kind of wanted to use that to characterize the size and frequency of the light oscillations. So we actually have a picture of the board, and I'm holding one right here. They're very small. It's uh, 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters on the grid pattern. This is the top face with the photodiodes. The bottom holds uh, the supporting electronics and some debug lights. Those are turned off during the experiment because, of course, it's a light-sensitive experiment. And we, of course, we light, we mount them to the payload line, but we want them to face skyward. So we actually have a hole in the middle, and we mount our line through the payload. Another thing, you know, lapse rates, how, how these atmospheric properties are changing throughout Earth's altitude. Um, we're going to be measuring pressure, temperature, and humidity from these boards. And additionally, we also want to know how the board is oriented, uh, north-south, but also absolute orientation to help us understand what we're seeing from the analog data. So every single one of the sensors has a uh, BNO055 IMU and a NEO M9N GPS on board. And of course, we're going to have ground stations. So we have some atmospheric science students who want to do their own gravity wave experiments. And these are going to be serving as uh, ground-based measurements for our shadow band experiments. And of course, high altitude video is a big focus of this project. So um, balloon launches. So we have a lot of experience here. The University of Alabama Huntsville balloon launches. We've launched uh, over 100 flights in our student organization. But with the you know rising price of helium and our goals of this experiment, we did not want to separate this uh, experiment into many, many balloon launches like you might expect with like a radio son sounding project. And so we've tried to combine this uh, experiment into a single line. And so here in Huntsville, we have a standing Saturn V replica. It stands 363 feet tall. And so that kind of served as a uh, inspiration for the scope of this experiment that we're going to distribute all of our instruments on a single line, eight meters apart, 
and they'll sample simultaneously at the same geolocation at different altitudes. And we'll tether this line in the period prior to eclipse totality. And then we will untether this line when shadow band formation is expected to begin 120 seconds before totality. And we will sweep this line of 16 instruments across the, the out at a constant ascent rate into Earth's uh, atmosphere. And they'll, of course, all be sampling and hitting similar points, but at different times, as you can see in that GIF, how it's kind of representing how different payloads cross the same threshold, but at different times. And we'll kind of sweep through the atmosphere, and then we'll terminate flight uh, following the two minutes after totality, and we can predict a safe landing location using a flight termination device and modeling that we do on the ground. So here's another diagram of how we set up our line. We have a line, we have a flight termination device. We have a platform for tracking and our cameras. We have all of our instruments mounted uh, skyward. We have streamers for visibility, and we have a parachute mounted at the halfway point, actually in this line. So the con ops kind of goes that, like I said, we tether the line, we launch the line, and then it sweeps upwards during the eclipse totality. And then we do terminate the flight, we cut down, and then the parachute uh, helps carry the hardware down for landing. We have a special kind of cut down device. We don't use hot wire cut downs. Uh, we actually use archery release triggers. So of course, uh, if you are experienced with archery, you might know that there are triggers to let go of the drawstring and those have to hold a lot of weight, but you can adjust them to you know, release with a tiny amount of force. So that's actually what we use as the basis for our flight termination systems. And they're very reliable and they're not prone to uh, breaking prematurely. And also about that centrally mounted parachute, we kind of put that in the middle so the line folds. It kind of uh, reduces its size so it doesn't come down quite as tall as it went up. And we've done some modeling, and I'm at the blaze of this because I'm running out of time, but we've done a lot of modeling and prediction to try and figure out our launch locations. This is actually from the Winthrop Rockefeller Institute. Some of you might be going there in Moralton, Arkansas, uh, showing surface winds because surface winds are a uh, issue for us. And we've also done floating predictions and high split predictions as far as us. Uh, where we're going to land this payload. Here you can see the difference that a different cut down altitude puts you as far as where you're going to land. This is also out of Moralton, Arkansas. So we've done some test flights. We did a flight back in July. Uh, that was to validate some of the sensors we were selecting because we're going to make 16 plus boards. We wanted to make sure we were selecting uh, proper components. So we traded different components and put competing sensors on this flight. Kind of flew it on a high altitude line. So you can see two boards going up there. And then demo two, uh, our second flight in September was actually a full integration test of the entire system. We had six fully populated payloads, but then we actually had 10 mass simulators because we had not gotten enough electronics yet. And this was launched at its complete scale. So the diagram I showed earlier was accurate to the actual size of what we put out, a 128 meter line. So you can see that here. You can see some of those red payloads are the simulated ones, but there are real payloads up there along this line. And we flew that to an altitude of five kilometers. So this is kind of some telescope footage of that. And we did cut down uh, after our simulated mission. And you can see on the right there, the parachute actually at the top uh, and the line folded in a V shape uh, like our diagram showed. So our line folding descent uh, did work as intended. We did bring this system out to uh, Texas during the annular eclipse. We're in Poteet, Texas, but most people who went to Texas will tell you it was very windy that day. Uh, it was very overcast that day. And so we did not deploy uh, this system to its full extent. And we actually disconnected a section of this line uh, and flew it as a traditional balloon, a small section with four instruments, and the rest became ground units. Uh, no shadow bands were detected in our site during the annular eclipse, which is expected, uh, although sh shadow bands are known to form in some high uh, annularity eclipses that are close to totality. So looking for that. Here's a footage of the traditional line we put up. You can see one of the boards right there. We actually let this one go much higher because of how the clouds were that day, just to try and get above those clouds. So as far as our plans for 2024, we're going to be adjusting our procedures based on all the challenges we faced in October. Uh, and we'll be doing another launch uh, next month, uh, February 3rd. We're doing a full systems test again, and we're securing some launch sites in Texas right now. The Lake Whitney State Park group, uh, some people out there wanted to help us. So, yeah, we're looking forward to travel in April and do this experiment alongside the NEBP payloads, which we're, of course, participating in as well, and various projects from within the uh, university. So uh, thank you, everyone. I've had a great team working on this. A lot of people made this possible, working very hard over many, many months. So that's it. Um, ready for questions uh, right on time.
Any questions? We've got a couple of minutes. Even though this is relatively light, do you need any special permissions to fly this? We've contacted people and as written, uh, part 101 uh, allows tethered balloons up to 500 feet. And then the unmanned free balloon uh, does not specify its length other than visibility requirements for trailing antennas uh, longer than 50 feet, which is a very gray area uh, from people we've discussed. But as far as the actual mission time, it's only flying for approximately 10 minutes is how long you're actually in the air. You're only going to a controlled altitude underneath the cloud ceiling as possible up to five kilometers. So, um, I I think the only regulation you might run afoul with is the um, the amount of tension or uh, the the line has to break at a certain um, uh, weight that's on so, there. Um, and since you have such a long one. We got kind of litigious with that one. The actual requirements written about the separation of payloads from the line. Um, it's actually right. not the line itself uh, in its tension, how it is exactly written. And part 101 is not written very well if you really poke right. holes at it. But the payloads do separate a fixed impact force of, I believe, 50 pounds. Um, is something we looked yep. at. Mm -hmm. We have one hand up. We have one raised hand. Yeah, my name's uh, Dave Turncheck from the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, you actually showed uh, our data in your paper, the shadow band detection yes. that we had at 88,000 feet. And uh, we're doing exactly the same stuff again. We're doing two balloon launches with light sensors. And then we ha are trying to uh, collect atmospheric science data so that we can determine where the turbulent boundary layer is, sort of a double check, right? And we have mm -hmm. this array of many sensors on the ground. We actually have someone who's flying a plane with our light sensors through the path of totality. So we're uh, approaching this in a big way. Anyway, I just wanted to mention that because I'm very happy to see that you're doing this because I think our result from 2017 really needs to be confirmed because it's a fundamentally different interpretation than what you would read on something like Wikipedia. Yes. That's exactly what I thought because we were doing a literature yeah. review early on in our campaign to do eclipse ballooning experiments. Yeah. And yes, yeah, it's, it's very interesting findings from y'all's uh, experiment. Yeah. So, so I'm going to be emailing you um, so we can uh, just... I don't know, oh, learn something from each other. Absolutely. I'll DM you my email uh, or my preferred email. Okay, great. Okay, thanks. Matthew, can we take a question from Santiago? Quick. Santiago, you have your hand up. I believe that was, was that just who was talking? Oh, maybe. I thought it was a different person talking. Anyway, go ahead. Okay. Uh, sorry. Yes, okay. that, that's right. So Dave Turncheck was talking from uh, from my uh, uh, from my connection. So sorry about that. No problem. Okay. Good. Just make sure you receive my uh, my message. That's who I direct messages. Uh, sure, yeah. sure. Yeah, we we got it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Um. All right. Well, with that, we do want to get on to the next um series of talks. So. Uh, thank you so much.